The following program is paid for by Absolute Mortgage, a division of Finance of America Mortgage, LLC, Equal Housing Lender, NMLS 1071, AZBK 0910184. Tina Mitchell, MLO 145420, is a licensed loan originator with Absolute Mortgage. Visit absoluteloans.com or call 888-90-HOMES for cost information. You're listening to The Money Hour with your host, Tina Mitchell, sponsored by Absolute Mortgage, a division of Finance of America Mortgage. Now in the studio, local mortgage and finance expert, Tina Mitchell. Welcome to The Money Hour at 1150 AM, KKNW, the Saturday, July 30th show. I am your host and mortgage expert, Tina Mitchell. Each week, I share expert advice and inside knowledge on today's events in our local economy and how it can affect your money. If you're hearing my show at a different time or day, you are listening to a rebroadcast, but I'm here to answer any questions or connect you with the guests that I have in studio today. Please call the show at one 855 400 1150. Again, that's 1 855 400 1150, or you can always go online at the moneyhour.com. And my lineup for today's show I have Dave Wilson with Stagings and Design Network. Busy summer in staging. We're going to be talking about staging uh, homes, getting it ready to uh, sell in this crazy real estate market. My next guest in studio is Brooke Anderson with Kaiser Financial Advisors, preparing for high high cost in college. And it sounds like uh, Brooke is going through this personal experience right now with one of his children. So it's a good topic uh, for those of you getting ready in that stage. And last guest in studio, Judy Claiborne, state representative. Glad to have Judy back in studio to talk about transportation. Great information and great guests in studio. For more information on any topics discussed, please call into the show, 1-855-411-50. Again, that's 1-855-411-50 or online at themoneyhour.com. And to start out to today's show, we'll start it with a little money chat. Money. Money. We're going to talk a little bit on tips on new construction. Why new construction? There's a lot of opportunity in new construction. Sometimes you don't see as much craziness in making offers on new construction as you do resale homes. Um, So just having a little understanding of how new construction works and some tips, I wanted to share that with you today. First, most important tip is find a great agent. Having an experienced agent that knows new construction is great. Now, the site agent is employed by the builder or the listing company that's representing the builder. So that's important to understand, not to say that necessary you don't want to go that direction. But personally, myself, I'd like an idea of having a realtor that's not a representative of the builder or the listing company that's representing, but somebody on the outside. And there are a lot of really good ones. You can call the show because I have a handful of industry leaders that you can choose from that know a lot about new construction and and navigate through that process. Now, the the benefit is they know the, uh, the first I want to give the benefit of the site agent. The site agent knows the structure and how to offer um, in that peel process. The downside is if any issues come up, Again, they're representing the builder or the listing marketing company that's representing that builder. So it's a little more difficult because you can't represent both the buyer and the seller. Makes sense, right? So if you have an outside agent that's not represented by the builder, it's going to be a lot easier through that process. Now, be creative during the negotiations. Uh, Builders don't like to drop price. Really important to understand that. And the reason being is because once they drop a price on a home, it's going to affect the rest of the homes in that whole community. So that's not an area they like to do. Now, I'm not setting yourself in this market to be negotiating because we're not in a negotiating market. But it's important to understand if you're going through that process that you would never want to lower price with the builder. If anything, you're asking for upgrades or money towards closing costs. That's going to be a much better scenario scenario for the builder and they're more apt to do that because again it's not affecting um, the neighborhood. Consider an offer, ask your agent to do research on the builder's negotiation style and prior sales in the community and other developments they've built to determine if there's a particular effective way to approach that offer. Now the next tip that I like to share is get everything in writing. This isn't just new construction. This is all uh, purchase and sale contracts. But don't sign anything until everything has been negotiated, agreed upon, and written into the actual contract. If you're considering purchasing a home that is not yet complete, it's very important to spell out how the home's going to be finished, 
what will happen if construction is not completed on time and the deadlines for those decisions that will occur through the process to get an understand verbal conversations are not binding so everything important must be put in writing and signed by all parties now this part is important as far as whether construction's behind and and you know trust me the builder does not want construction to be behind because they're paying interest every day that it is but the reality a lot of things come up in the construction process, especially if you're buying a pre-sale, a home that's not already in the construction process. So if you've got a lock-in interest rate, there's going to be an expiration date. So you need to determine who's going to be paying for that extension to the lock if for some reason something doesn't happen on time. Builders offer, offer, often use customized purchase agreement documents in place of standard forms commonly used in the area. So ask your agent to get a copy of the builder's documents to review in advance. Ask your agent to point out in the agreement what happens if there are delays on either side. Now, what you see isn't always what you get is my next tip. The fit and finish of the model home doesn't necessarily represent what comes standard. So often the model homes reflect a mix of standard materials and fixtures, as well as some helpful upgrades. When turning the model home, make sure that you find out which is which. The important thing is to know exactly what you're going to be getting, what's available, and of course, what it was, it's going to cost you. Keep in mind that the cost can change, so the price quoted at the start may not be the same when you're just deciding to move forward. So ask your agent to help you get a list of the standard features and if available, a list of the common upgrades and their associated cost. Uh, next, uh, do your research on the builder. Visit other developments and talk to homeowners if possible. Search online for reviews, testimonials, and news. Keep in mind that many builders will have both happy and unhappy customers in the past everybody does but look for trends in the reviews and make sure any concerns that are um, that are there that they've been covered in the agreement documents and ask your agent if they've worked with the builder in the past and if they're aware of their reputation now get the home inspected um, new homes have problems too so hire an inspection to make sure an inspector to make sure that everything is safe and up to code even though the new homes have to pass permit inspections and an independent verification uh, with a with a qualified inspector is money inspector is money well spent so in many cases the builder will allow buyers to conduct an an, an, an independent inspection and agree to repair codes compliance issues but do not include a provision that would allow the buyer to walk away and retain their deposit if they're not satisfied with the results on the inspection. So ask your agent to investigate and explain the inspection process and your rights in the agreement to request repairs or terminate the agreement. Now, the outside inspectors, independent inspectors, almost all of them, if not, you want to make sure you find one that does, has a reinspect 12 months after the home. So once you've moved in, you can have that inspector. They're going to come back and relook at the house again after a year. So it's kind of a nice little benefit that you have with new, new construction. Uh, find out what's covered. Many new homes come with a warranty from the builder, but not all warranties are created equal. So know what it is and what it covers and for how long, how, how long it's going to cover it. Many builders use third-party warranty companies. In some cases, the manufacturer of certain products like windows uh, may have a separate warranty or guarantee, and the builder might refer all issues with those components and the manufacturer instead of handling any issues directly. So the builder should be able to provide details on which part of the home is covered by which policy. So ask your agent to obtain warranty information early in the process so that your offer can be prepared to address any concerns up front. Next tip, look to the future. Check with the city to see what the planned or the surrounding areas. If you have a view, will it still be there in five years? Moose builders put in resp the responsibility on the buyer to be aware of the neighborhood or the community, community dynamics related to other developments and in the area like traffic planning, uh, developments of neighborhood parcels. So many new communities also have homeowners associations that can impact your potential new home as well. So ask your agent about writing a review period for you to investigate the area or plan to do some research before submitting your offer. Last tip, 
do your homework on lenders. So don't automatically use the builder's lender. Shop around for the loan that is best for you, not them. Some builders require that you get pre-approved with the builder's preferred lender. That's fine. It makes sense. They want to make sure that everything's going to be okay. But by the time you are ready to make an offer, you probably have already spoken to a lender of your own. Your lender, again, no worries about doing that, but just make sure that you're having, that you've got the ability to choose which mortgage professional you want to work with. Now, um, tip, ask your agent to help you find if there are any um, special offers, promotions, contractual differences if you agree not to use the builder's lender. So in some situations, the builder is going to pay uh, $5,000 towards your closing costs if you use the builder's lender. If your outside lender is not going to do that because the builder's not, if the builder's not offering that to your outside lender, they're not going to be able to afford to do 5000 But what you want to do is just check and look at the apples to apples because a lot of times that somehow worked into the actual cost of doing the loan. So just make sure that you're covered there. Those are my tips for you on new construction. New construction is a great way to get into a home. Resale con- um, construction homes are a good way to get in as well. There's just a difference. So understanding what those are is going to help for you to be successful all the way through the process. Coming up next in the Money are busy summer and staging. Dave Wilson with Staging and Design Network right here, right here on 1150 AM KKNW after the short break. Love to golf while supporting children and seniors in our community? Join us at the Seattle King County Realtors Charity Golf Tournament August 1st at Fairwood Golf and Country Club in Renton. Proceeds will benefit two of our most deserving local charities, Sound Generation Senior Services and the Burn Children's Recovery Foundation. This fundraiser is presented by Seattle King County Realtors Affiliates and Young Professionals Network. For more information and to sign up for your tea time, go to nwrealtor.com. You're listening to The Money Hour with your host, Tina Mitchell. Sponsored by Absolute Mortgage, a division of Pinnacle Capital Mortgage Corporation. Now, in the studio, local mortgage and finance expert, Tina Mitchell. Welcome to the Money Hour with your host and mortgage expert, Tina Mitchell, right here on 1150 AM KKNW, the Saturday, July 30th show. I'm dedicated to my listeners, providing you with the tools needed to make informed decisions on matters that affect your money. If you're hearing my show at a different time or day, you are listening to a rebroadcast, but you can always call the show at 1-855-411-50. Again, that's one 855 400 1150 or online at themoneyhour.com to ask any questions or get connected with the guests that I have in studio today. And right now I'm going to have a conversation with Dave Wilson with Staging and Designs Network. Dave, thanks for coming back into studio. Oh, you're welcome. Glad to be here. And excited to get an update on what's happening uh, in your arena. And before we do that, a little bit about Dave. Uh, Dave, again, is with Staging and Designing Network. Uh, Dave is the CFO and COO of Staging and Design Network. He has a background in finance, accounting, operations, and merges and acquisition. Uh, He worked at Macaw Communications for 15 years and began his career as a CPA in public accounting. Prior to Staging Design Network, Dave was CFO and co-owner of On PR Public Relations. So getting a little idea of the, uh, we've talked a lot about the hot real estate market, and hot real estate market means a busy summer for you in the staging arena, and that's our conversation today. Tell my listeners uh, again about uh, what Staging and Design Network does and how it works. Okay. Well, uh, our name is actually pretty descriptive. Staging and Design Network um, started out as an ability for stagers to pool their inventories together, share and rent from each other, and instead of having access to only their specific inventory items for their home staging projects, they now had access to many other stagers inventories and they rent from each other to fulfill their their staging needs. The network bit of the name is really the secret sauce of our business, which is the software that tracks all this. Mm -hmm. It gets very complicated when uh, a typical home staging might have 50 items that go out from artwork to couches and tables and chairs, you name it. And in our world, that might be owned by 50 different members. Mm -hmm. So the software has to track all that 
and pay commissions to the appropriate people and do all that. So that's, um, that's the concept. It's more than just stagers that are part of us, but the, the, um, the business model is really exciting because it allows stagers to scale their business. We do everything else, um, including the moving of the furniture to and from the home mm -hmm. and, um, and tracking all that. So we take a lot of the headache out of the process. Of course, storage, they don't have to worry about storing their inventory anymore. We do all that. Yeah, I, I love the concept of what you uh, what you guys are doing. So has SDN been experiencing a busier season given what's been going on in the Seattle area and our real estate market? Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of the perfect storm where mm -hmm. you have um, a hot real estate market and then staging is just on the rise anyway. Uh, more and more homes are being staged uh, regardless of what's going on in, in real estate um, home sale trends. So, um, as they say, a rising tide lifts all boats, and that's kind of what we've really experienced. We're up over 48% over last year. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, so, it has been crazy. It's been uh, amazing to see this happen, and we've been scrambling to try to keep up with that demand. So, how are you guys dealing in, in that? How are you dealing with the uh, increased demand? Well, as you suspect, the 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 big piece is inventory, having inventory available to people. Um, we get our inventory from both members joining and bringing their, their product into the pool, mm -hmm. but SDN also provides a lot of inventory ourselves. So we've been buying like gangbusters the last month. We, we have placed so many orders um, with all of our furniture manufacturers mm -hmm. and have been receiving inventory and it's amazing because we get it in and barcode it and photograph it and put it up on our website yeah. and it's out the door um, immediately so wow. um, the the demand is there and um, our technology fortunately that part of it's working and allowing us to keep up with it it's mm -hmm. more the resources so we've um, increased staff we've um, as i said bought more inventory uh -huh. we, we're um meeting with investors constantly to continue to raise money to um, to scale the business. Awesome. So what are the advantages to a professional stager? So any professional stager that I have listening to the show right now, Dave, talk to them about the, the advantage um, over and above what you have already for using SDN and your services. Yeah, I, th I think the, the short answer there is is scalability. Mm -hmm. um, if, you're a, if you're a stager, and you're good at what you're you're doing you're going to get more demand naturally you're going to your name's going to get out there you're going to have more people calling you as that happens you're going to need more inventory because instead mm -hmm. of doing two or three homes now you need to do five or ten homes suddenly you have to have a lot more inventory a place to store it people to move it to and from those staging locations and what we've seen um and heard from our members the the beauty of this is it lets them continue to be focused on their core passion which is staging a lot of interior decorator type personalities in this mm -hmm. business if the business grows you become a logistics warehouse manager at some point and a lot of people don't want any part of that so we you know we've talked to stagers who have grown they um, might have four or five warehouses where they are actually storage units where they've crammed their furniture. Each project they're running to and from these places, pulling things out. We have a huge 15,000 square foot warehouse, 30 foot ceilings, forklifts. The The process is much more... Now your warehouse says it's pretty impressive. Yeah, you're, huh. it's much more geared towards that kind of volume. So mm -hmm. um, the stager now goes online from, you know, they can be sitting at home in their bathrobe at night and they go on the website and just start clicking on the pieces they want. It The system fulfills the order, goes to our warehouse. Our people pull those items off the mm -hmm. shelf, put it on the loading dock in that next, uh, on the scheduled day, then our trucks deliver it to the to the home. Our guys unload it, set it up, and um, and then and same thing in reverse. When they're done with that staging, they go online, schedule a D stage, and then we come pick it up and yeah. put it back in our warehouse. 
Yeah, when I'm uh, coaching business professionals, I always tell them as an entrepreneur, the important part is for us, including you know myself and any other entrepreneur, is to get the business and then to hire out someone to manage the process. And right. really, that's what a stager is able to do with your company is mm -hmm. they can go get the business, focus on the business, um, uh, get connected with those business opportunities, and then hire you guys to manage that process so Absolutely. that it's, uh, it's just beautiful. So let's talk a little bit besides the um, uh, the professional stagers that we're talking about, what other types of members do you have a part of your organization? We've seen a, a increase in builders. Okay. Um, builders have um, Makes total their sense. model homes and, and they, um, they need product. That's not their core focus. They wanna build houses, mm -hmm. they wanna sell them quickly. Um, they don't want to be storing furniture. So we've had a couple new relationships this year with uh, some large local builders that have been really successful for both them and us. And we've, we literally stock that model home with the product they like. And then mm -hmm. when, when that house sells, we go and move it to the next one. And we just take that off their plate, which they love. We have real estate agents that have um, joined brokers and even consumers because, mm -hmm. um, as a member of SDN, you get some um, discounts on furniture purchases. So we have a lot of uh, members, but there's a lot of realtors too that, yes. that are dabbling in this as well. So I've got all of those listeners. I have stagers that listen, in to, listen to my show. I have realtors, I have builders, and I have consumers. So mm -hmm. let's talk to all of them. How do they join SDN? Well, our website, which is staginganddesignnetwork.com, has um, contact information. We um, have gotten so busy that we actually need you to call and schedule an appointment now to come in. Um, and we have a great showroom that has a lot of what we mm -hmm. offer um, on display. And we like to show people that um, when they come in. If we have the time, we can show them the warehouse as well and uh -huh. then really walk through the program with them. But it's all online. Our phone number's on there as well. You can call. We have um, design consultants and salespeople that, that can respond Perfect. quickly. Perfect. And I have to give a shout out to you guys as well, because I'm really big on education. I do a lot of education for my uh, referral partners within my own uh, community. And you guys are doing a lot of lunch and learns and things yes. uh, for all the business professionals out there. So I just um, want to give a shout out for that. So uh, future plans. We're going to continue to grow. We're okay. looking at um, next year opening another location here locally, probably in the north end. Um, and then that's going to really um test us to see how how we respond to a multi uh, market type location and in, in uh, process and then we're going to roll this out around the country we have mm, uh, six thousand members on our linkedin website we have people constantly saying when are you coming to mm -hmm. orange county or when are you come yes. to, to arizona so we we have um, a leg up there as far as that that market and i think the demands there as we talked earlier staging's on the rise yes. and this is a, a elegant way to meet that that growing demand. So, Dave, I, I know that you've been involved in startups before. How does this compare with the process and what you've uh, what you've done for staging and design network? You know, the similarities are are the growing pains. Um, startups always have um, you've, you're figuring out things as you go, and it's an interesting. Uh, dilemma when you have growth happening and and you're putting processes in place at the same time. Um, I call it kind of a, a control chaos. So with any startup, you have to have an appetite for that. If you like all your ducks in a row and things mm -hmm. very methodical, you're not a good candidate for a startup because it it can be uh, uh, it can be maddening at times. Just figuring things out but sure. it's very exciting mm -hmm. and we have a incredible team of people people that are all energized by by this world we're in so it's cool yeah that's awesome dave and you know i, th I think even a startup or a long-term existing company if you're not stirring things up in your business you're doing something wrong because it's right. always about change it's always about growth and so uh, very very exciting yes um wrap up in a minute here um any call to action that you have for uh, my listeners listening today dave check us out if you um if you uh, are a stager 
and you're growing, this is a this is a way to really scale your business quickly. Mm -hmm. um, we have people that join that are interior designers. They don't have to invest a nickel in furniture. They join our network and they can start staging, hang yeah. out their shingle, and start yeah. working right away. So it's exciting for uh, young people getting into this industry. So, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, Dave, thank you so much for uh, coming back and Thanks joining me in studio. Yeah. Say hi to all the team back there. Yeah, I will. Thank okay. you. Okay. Coming up next in the Money Hour, preparing a high cost in college. Brooke Anderson with Kaizen Financial Advisors right here at 1150 AM at KKNW. Have you saved enough to provide for the retirement you envision? Is your current lifestyle putting your future at risk? Are you struggling to prioritize financial goals? These are questions all investors have. Brooke Anderson with Kaizen Financial Advisors helps individuals just like you navigate the complex world of financial decision making. Brooke can help you design a retirement plan that will give you confidence as you look to the future. Kaizen Financial Advisors take a holistic approach to your financial life and will make recommendations that encompass all of your priorities. Brooke Anderson will explain the issues and his recommendations in a simple and understandable way. Brooke wants to know and understand you both personally and financially. He'll emphasize a simple low-cost and diversified investment philosophy grounded in academic research. He's a CPA, MBA, and a registered financial advisor working in a fiduciary capacity for his clients. To learn more about what Kaizen Financial Advisors can do for you, call me, Brooke Anderson, at 425-321-5801. Again, that's Brooke Anderson at 425-321-5801. I look forward to hearing about you and helping you on your path to financial security. You're listening to The Money Hour with your host, Tina Mitchell. Sponsored by Absolute Mortgage, a division of Pinnacle Capital Mortgage Corporation. Now, in the studio, local mortgage and finance expert, Tina Mitchell. Well, welcome back to The Money Hour with your host and mortgage expert, Tina Mitchell, right here on 1150 AM KKNW, the Saturday, July 30th show. I've built a network of elite industry, industry professionals every week sharing their knowledge and expertise with you, my listeners. If you're hearing my show at a different time or day, you are listening to a rebroadcast to talk with my guest in studio. If you'd like to chat with me, you can call the show at one 855 411150 Again, that's one 855 411150 or online at themoneyhour.com. And having a conversation right now with Brooke Andersons with Kaizen Financial Advisors. We're going to be talking about preparing for high cost in college. Brooke, thanks for joining me back in studio. Yeah, thank you for having me. And you told me before we got started here with the show, you're actually going through this with your son right now. So it was a perfect time to bring this to, uh, topic to my uh, my guests. Yeah, no, it certainly hits home for me. Yeah. And a little bit about Brooke. Um, he's a financial advisor with Kaizen Financial Advisors and return guest right here on the Money Hour. He is both a CPA and MBA with over 18 years experience as a finance professional in the Northwest. Uh, his firm, Kaizen Financial Advisors, is a fee-based advisor that provides comprehensive and holistic financial planning and wealth management services to uh, individual clients. Kaizen Advisors are fiduciaries and thus always work in the best interest of their clients. Uh, Brooks, again, thanks for joining me in studio. So here we are in the middle of summer break, yet we're only a month away from the start of college for many recent high school graduates and returning college students. So if you have kids that might be uh, someday attending college, you have undoubtedly contemplated the high cost of college education, maybe even with a little pit in your stomach. Uh, my next guest, Brooke, financial advisor, who will share some insights and strategies to help you prepare for the high cost in college. Let's go ahead and start right out to frame things up. Just how expensive is college right now today? Sure. With my son's recent graduation from high school and his enrollment in college, I can personally attest that college is expensive. For those of you in a similar situation, I feel your pain. A couple of statistics. University of Washington right now, all in, is just over 27000 a year. That's based on in-state tuition. And you might find it interesting that that tuition is only 44% of that whole $27,000 price tag. To put in perspective just how big that is, you'd need to save about $500 a month from birth to graduation to cover four years at the University of Washington. 
When we talk about private schools, the average sticker price is just north of 46000 a year. In perspective, that's about 1.7 times what it costs to go to the University of Washington in-state right now. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's daunting. As you might already be aware, for quite some time, we've also experienced tuition inflation that has far exceeded both core inflation and wage inflation, so it's likely to become even more expensive as we go forward. So, Brooke, I've heard that um, our state recently took some action to reduce the control of the cost of tuition in Washington. Can you tell my uh, listeners a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. About a year ago, in fact, it was July of 2015, the state of Washington passed the Washington College Affordability Act. And the result of that was a decrease in tuition last year and also for this upcoming school year. And that covered all Washington public higher education institutions. Um, it also limits future tuition increases to a growth rate that does not exceed the average hourly wage rate in the state of Washington, which I should point out over the past 10 years has been a little less than 1% per year. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and be aware this cost restriction only covers tuition. And remember that example of the University of Washington, tuition is only about 44% of the total cost. The rest of it is not restricted by these, uh, these guides. Uh, lastly, this legislation um, uh, just affects our public in-state schools. So you can think of uh, University of Washington, WSU, Western, Central, Eastern, Evergreen State College, and our community colleges and our technical schools. So from your experience, Brooke, uh, counseling clients, tell, tell me some of the biggest mistakes that you see people make regarding college financial matters. Sure. There's really four big ones that come to mind. The first is don't evaluate college investments in isolation and independent from the rest of your financial planning. College savings is just one element of your plan. Getting this wrong is a big deal. College choices can permanently change the course of your financial life, in particular, your retirement plan. My, my advice here is just don't jeopardize your retirement to fund college. And remember, if you have to, you can finance a portion of your education, but you can't finance your retirement. The second uh, uh, major mistake I see a lot is taking on excessive debt. Today in the U.S., 42 million people now owe $1.3 trillion in student debt. Wow. That's almost $31,000 per student. And even more shocking, that's a nearly a 300% increase in the, in the uh, debt per student over the past 20 years. And the projections look even scary if you it, it look, make it look even scarier if you look at those graphed out. Uh, also, the costs associated with interest expense, delayed savings, and the loss of financial flexibility can be life changing, and unfortunately, in a very negative way. And it, by the way, if you didn't, if you missed this uh, month's cover of Consumer Reports magazine, you might want to read it before you take on any school debt. Um, I think the cover story tagline kind of says it all. It's, it uh, reads, quote, uh, I kind of ruined my life by going to college, end quote. Wow. And, uh, and there's a bunch of horror stories in there of just what uh, excessive debt can do to you. Yeah. Yeah. So again, I, I just encourage you, don't be naive around debt. Uh, number three is focusing too much on a school's name recognition, which often comes with a big price tag and not enough on the value per dollar spent. Studies have concluded that there are select school and degree combinations that fail to yield a positive return on investment, meaning that you'd be better off if you had just taken that money instead of spending it on tuition and books and everything else, if you invested it and just held onto it and accepted a lower paying job, you would actually financially come out ahead. And that's scary. And that's something that's becoming more prevalent as time goes forward mm -hmm. and schools become more expensive. So I would suggest doing the research and view education as an investment and demand a reasonable return on the money you spend. And if you're looking for some data around this in terms of what kind of wages you can earn and what degrees and from what schools and all that, the uh, Department of Education has a great tool called the College Scorecard. Um, they put, it's on the website is collegescorecard.gov, and it gives you some insights on that. Mm -hmm. uh, lastly, number four, I'd say, is not pursuing every avenue you can to reduce your cumulative costs. Don't just accept the four-year sticker price and manage. You, you want to manage it, and you want to lower that. You know, remember, this is one of the biggest investments you'll ever make. So you want to really take control of it. Yeah, some some great tips and uh, great information that you're uh, that you're bringing in. So let's I, I want to go to your last point that you mentioned uh, pursuing every avenue to reduce costs. Can you share some of the ways that my listeners can reduce the cost of college? Let's talk about saving money because that's what the show is all about. Sure, sure. So I'll, I'll go through 10 of them that, okay. that kind of come to mind. Uh, the first is start with credits before you begin. 
And this can be accomplished via programs like Running Start or obtaining college credits through AP or IB testing programs. And again, you can start, obviously, without paying a college rate of tuition to acquire those credits. Also, considering, uh, consider integrating some community college work before or during your college pursuits. Um, the credits are likely to be less expensive, but be sure that you uh, double check the transferability of those credits before you enroll in a, in a, a community college to augment your other uh, schooling options. And, so, and also, uh, take advantage of in-state tuition and possibly live at home or off campus, which is generally less expensive mm -hmm. than, than being uh, out of state or living on campus. Uh, number four is to seek private scholarships. They take effort, but they, you, know, you won't receive anything if you don't try. And my recommendation would really be to target small markets. And what I mean by that is where the number of applicants is restricted by something that, uh, that, that you might qualify for. And a, a typical one might be a geographic area requirement. Maybe it's mm -hmm. only from your school district, or maybe it's, maybe it's targeting scholarships at your parents' workplace. And so it's a limited pool. And you'll generally have a, bit, a little bit better luck than, a, than attacking some of the big national programs. I'd also stay on track to graduate on time or early. Unfortunately, uh, five and six year graduation uh, time frames is not, not uncommon good. Yeah. Not, uh, and, not wow. good. and yeah. very expensive. Yes. So, so the, also uh, is number six, if you're, if you're really ambitious, take the maximum number of credits that a standard tuition covers, which might allow you to finish early. Take advantage of the fact it's one cost that may cover regardless of how many credits you take between a certain uh, a range of, or limit. And also use bunching as well as other strategies to maximize financial aid. Bunching is where you have an older sibling who delays the start of their schooling until their younger sibling is ready to go because having two kids in college at yeah. the same time proportionally increases your financial aid. And there's, there's other strategies that you can use as well. And especially also if you have any kind of financial hardship or special situation, make sure you challenge your financial aid package. You may end up getting more than what you'd expect. Number eight is take advantage of special tax accommodations like the American tax or the American Opportunity Tax Credit, which will give you a $2,500 tax credit if you spend $4,000 or more on qualified expenses. There's some limitations around that, but it's certainly available to many. Number nine is take summer courses. Sometimes they're less expensive mm. than you'll find in the fall or winter terms of, of, uh, of certain schools. And then lastly would be shop for reasonable total cost of attendance. And it's, if applicable, you should incorporate merit opportunities to offset costs as well. And for this, you'll really need to know and understand how your students' GPA and test scores can generate material merit opportunities and scholarships. Um, so as a result, you don't necessarily want to rule out all private schools just because they're, they have a high sticker price. Oftentimes, the combination of, of uh, merit scholarship awards and whatnot can actually make the cost equal or even potentially lower than mm -hmm. a public option. Got it. So you touched on the uh, financial aid, a uh, high level of how, how does it work and how might one figure out if they're going to qualify for that financial aid, Brooke? Sure. Kind of from the 30,000 foot level, it's actually very complicated, but I'll just give you kind of a high level overview. Financial aid is determined by formulas that considers your income, your assets, and the cost of attendance for the school that you're looking at. And this data is collected by probably some documents you've heard of, the FAFSA. Mm -hmm. And also the CSS profile, that's the equivalent for private schools. About 300 schools use that uh, form as well. And these financial aid formulas calculate what is called your EFC, or your expected financial contribution. This is the part of your college expenses that you're expected to cover through your own resources. And your maximum financial aid will always equal the cost of attendance for that particular school minus your EFC, or your expected financial contribution. And the ca calculations for the EFC are complicated, but in general, the, the, the formulas work out such that it's about 47% of your income above a certain exemption level that is deemed to be available for college. And on the asset side, it's about 5.6% of your assets, again, that are going above a certain exclusion amount. And by the way, your primary home is not included as one of those assets. Okay. And the best way to estimate that is to use an online calculator. I recommend the, uh, the FAFSA forecaster. It's actually found on the FAFSA website. Mm -hmm. It's very helpful and it gives you a very good idea of what that number will look like. And the one thing I'll point out is you want to be aware that uh, there are many strategies out there to maximize financial aid. A lot of them involve things like using insurance products and moving assets into insurance products yes. to avoid yep. the calculation yep. uh, within your asset base. 
And in general, I would not recommend going down those paths unless you truly need that insurance. Yeah, and there's, a lot of there's so many things to go over that you know really um, picking up the phone and having a conversation with you and and finding out all the options available to your specific needs is really and uh, really important. So if you have sufficient resources and time, what are the best ways to save for college, Brooke? Sure, for most people, not all, but a 529 plan generally proves to be the best way to go. Uh, 529 plans are sponsored by individual states, but regardless of what state you use, you can use that uh, those dollars for uh, a school that resides in any state. Uh, this allows you to contribute after-tax dollars to invest for future educational expenses, and uh, your investments will grow tax-free, and the proceeds are tax-free when you use them for qualified educational expenses. Works very similar to a Roth IRA, but for college expenses. And the one point I'll make here, too, is you want to really shop around. There are some very good plans out there, and there's also some not-so-great plans. So make sure you focus on low cost and great management. Perfect. So as I uh, wrap up your, uh, my time here with you, uh, Brooke, any financial final thoughts, final financial thoughts you want to leave with my listeners? Sure. I'll just kind of summarize a few things. One, select your school with a cost benefit in mind. Make sure your investment is worth the money you're putting into it. Two, be able to, or uh, if you're able, start early. College is very expensive and it'll take considerable time and dedication to save uh, adequate funds to cover a degree. Three, expect uh, costs to be more than you anticipate. School inflation continues to be problematic. And don't forget about indirect expenses. There's a lot more to, uh, expenses than just tuition, books, room, board, and fees. And lastly, whatever you do, avoid excessive debt. You'll thank yourself later. Brooke, thank you. Amazing uh, topic. I appreciate you bringing that in. And it's perfect timing for you, perfect timing, I'm sure, for a lot of uh, our listeners. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Coming up next in the Money Hour, what's happening with transportation? Judy Claiborne, State Representative, right here on 1150 AM KKNW after this short break. Hi, I'm State Representative Judy Cliburn. I represent the 41st Legislative District, which includes Mercer Island, Newcastle, and parts of Bellevue, Issaquah, and Sammamish. I am also the chair of the House Transportation Committee, which means that I have a lead role in deciding how our highway dollars are spent. We are facing many challenges as a state, from fixing up roads and bridges to fully funding our schools, and I want to hear from you about how we can tackle these tough issues. If you have a question or concern about your state government, please get in touch. You can reach my office by calling 360-786-7926 or emailing me at judy.cliburn at leg.wa.gov. I hope to hear from you soon. You're listening to The Money Hour with your host, Tina Mitchell. Sponsored by Absolute Mortgage, a division of Pinnacle Capital Mortgage Corporation. Now, in the studio, local mortgage and finance expert, Tina Mitchell. Welcome back to The Money Hour with your host and mortgage expert, Tina Mitchell, right here at 1150 AM KKNW, the July 30th show. I'm here to empower our community, providing you with opportunities and solutions when it comes to your money. If you're hearing my show at a different time or day, you are listening to a rebroadcast. You can call the show at one 855 400 1150. Again, that's 1 855 400 1150 or online at themoneyhour.com. Discuss anything regarding money uh, with myself or talk to the guests that I have in studio today. And right now in studio, I have Judy Cliborn, state representative, here to talk about transportation. Judy, thank you so much for coming back in studio. Thank you, Tina. It's always a pleasure to come. Well, and it's always a pleasure for my listeners because this is a big topic, um, especially in, in our area here talking about transportation. Just a little background on Judy. State representative has been a resident of Mercer Island for 45 years. She was mayor of Mercer Island for four years, city councilwoman from 1990 to 2001, and executive director of the Mercer Island Chamber of Commerce. Her current House Committee assignments are transportation chair and health and care and wellness. Her legislative priorities are creating a sound transportation system that protects trade dependent businesses throughout the state and keeps Washington's economy globally competitive, continuing to increase job opportunities for working families and ensuring adequate health care and coverage and accessibility to Washingtonians. 
Wow. Wow. I mean, that's a lot of stuff that you're responsible for, Judy, and and just, you know, helping a a lot of us here in in the Seattle area be a little bit more happy. Well, I do my best, and it's something I think everybody's interested in, so it's good to put my... Uh, work shoulder into it all definitely that. is yes. and I love having your segment in my in my library that I can share with uh, people <laughs> after the show so uh, Judy what's the most important issue in transportation right now well as uh, we probably have been hearing over the last couple of years we've been working to put a revenue package together yes. so that we would have new revenue and I think that this is going to be a year where that might not be as obvious because the big topic of conversation now is education. And when people get caught up in some other kind of uh, conversation, it it we do, we have a problem doing more than one thing. Well, I when can't, we're in there's Olympia. no such thing as multitasking. I I know that. Not in Olympia. Mm-hmm. But it is still an issue and it and I think that they go together. I think if you're in any kind of business, you understand that Transportation is what connects us. Mm -hmm. It's not just about jobs. It's about the economic development that goes with the the transportation. And whether it's uh, roads or rail or or, or light rail, since we have another guest here. Yes. um, I, I think these are all so critical to our state and it is the whole state not just Mm -hmm. this puget sound region although we do have our special things of course yes so judy why do we need more gas tax or other transportation revenue when we have such a high gas tax already i always have to to explain this because i think there are very few people who understand that even though we pay a high gas tax Mm -hmm. here other states don't have they often use um, their general fund okay. to help pay for their transportation. So we don't do that here. And so we have to have the gas tax be enough to pay for all of our projects. What really bothers people is that they think they're paying in now and they wonder where it goes. Yes. Well, I'm paying this high gas tax. Yep. Where is it going? So and, where is it going? <laughs> and it is right now going to finish off 421 projects that were promised starting in 2003 and 2005. Okay. So that's exciting. It's bonded. Mm-hmm. And so for the next 25 years, the, that gas tax will go to pay off bonds. Okay. And that makes it mean, that means that we have no revenue for anything new. Yeah. So we've been, that's not a good thing. We need to have a little money. Well, there's an ongoing need. I know that people uh, hear about things that uh, they want to know why we're building a tunnel when mm-hmm. we could be doing something else. You know, the tunnel was promised in the five cents that was passed in 2005. So that's wow. how long it takes projects to get going yeah. and to get finished. Mm-hmm. So we now have 12 years without any new revenue. And if we don't have new revenue, then we can't have projects like 167 and 509 that keeps ports open yeah and, and the projects that are important and we, in you know being and being in the I do the mortgage side not the real estate side but I'm in that that community and I you know it's important for our economy to and and to to be able to have good transportation and it's going to make everybody you know everybody are ha- happier be able to make decisions on where they you know where they want to work and make it convenient and save money so Judy why should we put more revenue into Washington State Department of Transportation when all we hear about is mismanagement. I know. And I think it's really easy to sell papers Mm -hmm. when you have something that's going on that uh, people want to read about. They're very curious about having the largest tunnel boring machine in the world, at least for the next month or so. And uh, (laughs) the fact that it is stuck is uh, it is a reflection of what they, they think there is mismanagement okay. at DOT, but the pro- the problem is is that we have hired someone to do that, mm-hmm. and so DOT has hired a tunnel partnership who bought a tunnel boring machine from yeah. Hitachi. That tunnel boring machine is still on um, on warranty. Yeah, they will fix it. Mm-hmm. It is a drag to have it sitting there, and I think it is very difficult for people to remember that there, even though the tunnel is not uh, boring there are still 400 people working on the sure. tunnel project on each end yeah wow so it will at some point uh, w- within the next year it will get restarted mm-hmm. it will finish and when it's done i think people will be shocked at how uh, how much it's appreciated yeah so judy what about the climate change issues that uh that we've been talking about 
You know, this is something that's just come up in the just in the last part of the last session, and and then the governor just came out and made his executive order to move this whole issue forward. It has impacts in many different areas, but I think in transportation, it, since transportation is identified as one of the largest drivers of climate impact, mm -hmm. then it, we stand to come into some, uh, some way that people will want to change how we use transportation. So I, when I talk to the governor, and he has a task force that's going forward, and mm -hmm. we will be following along, and there are some things that I think are really popular and, and that people will like like switching to um, more fuel efficient co cars yep. or using alternative uh, vehicles, uh, electric vehicles and having al alternative fuels. That's gonna mm -hmm. be not too too hard. I think things that will be a little more uh, troublesome for people to understand, including myself, will be the impacts of uh, if you tried to do cap and trade or you do um, some kind of uh, carbon tax. Those okay. are things that people don't understand, and I think it'll take a lot of learning for all of us, including the legislature. Mm -hmm. I don't see this going forward with a whole uh, wholesale just swoop down and get a whole bunch of things done. Yeah. But I know that there are things that we're already doing because electric vehicles, we're one of the highest electric vehicle use states in the I nation. I didn't realize that. Wow. Congratulations to us. Yeah. We're, yeah. And, and, and the other thing that that does, of course, is it decreases the amount of gas tax that comes uh -huh. in. And so yeah. that's another reason why we're going to have to uh, make sure that we have more gas tax. Yeah. So, so Judy, can you explain to our listeners what, what can happen if we don't do anything? Well... I think that we have to maintain what we have, and this has mm -hmm. been a very difficult time to decide whether you go out for a small package. I think this, there's been some talk of, say, uh, a three-cent gas tax that goes just for maintenance and preservation. If you use the roads, you understand that they're getting pretty worn out, and, yeah. and the bridges, if we don't keep them up, we have to close them or waitlist them, and, and that is huge. It's devastating. It's devastating to, to our... Um, to our economy and yeah. and I if you're I know that people who are in your business because I talk to people in real estate all the time mm -hmm. you're people are deciding where they're going to live oh yeah because of congestion and because of the way they have to use the roads at mm -hmm. different times and it just yep. it makes your decisions uh, it, it does impact your decisions mm -hmm. that you make so if we don't then I know we're going to have more congestion yep I I think that there are, will be fewer uh, things that we can do to keep the economy going. And I, uh, it concerns me that we don't look like we can get this done mm -hmm. because it, it reflects on our government that we can't make a decision and sure. actually move forward. Well, what about uh, King County? When, when you went to the voters for transit and county roads, since it didn't pass, what now? So King County has... Uh, its own funding, which they went okay. out and they asked. And so it really isn't a, it isn't an impact to the state as much as uh, they provide a lot of level of service. It, uh, not just the state provides service in, in transportation. So definitely they have the transit side. Mm -hmm. And that I think has been uh, interesting. The other transit agencies, when 695 passed, which was the first IMAN initiative, okay. that used to serve all the pay. Uh, it paid for all transit. The state had a pretty big, uh, a pretty big payment that they gave to transit uh -huh. service. That was eliminated. And so we have not, what we did is we gave the transit agencies the sales tax. They have a, a part of the sales tax that they can use. Mm -hmm. The other transit agencies, because we had the recession, it was really low. The other transit agencies all announced that they were going to make cuts. But they came back, and in some cases, they even increased their service. Okay. In King County, mm -hmm. I think we're going to have to, I think they will get together. They will look at how they can use their dollars mm -hmm. that are coming in now at a higher rate. And they have to get real about what they can do. The suburbs have not seen an increase in the, in their um, service uh -huh. because Seattle has the density. But one of the things that I think would be interesting when Sound Transit gets to talk is this new effort that the, uh, the county executive, who is the chair of Sound Transit, mm -hmm. who is also 
uh, the county executive in charge of Metro tra Transit is saying, how can we work together? How can we make this a more efficient system? Yeah. If Sound Transit is supposed to be the trunk, then let the, the spokes be Metro. And mm -hmm. we had always envisioned that as the way that would work. So even though the, ca uh, the state may not have a huge way of helping at this point because we haven't been able to pass any revenue. Uh -huh. I think that there are things that by working together, we will be able to have better transit. And oh, everything's better. Together. It's, everything's better working together without a, without a doubt. Judy, I've got just a second here with you before I got to take a break. Just really quickly, who's going to pay for the tunnel? Who's going to pay for the tunnel? Yes. The tunnel is going to be paid for through the uh, large project budget that we have with multiple layers of contingency mm -hmm. and the uh, thing maybe I should clarify that the only thing that I know who won't pay for the tunnel is the city of Seattle so it. It, it will be done by the state wonderful Judy thank you again so much for uh, coming back in studio and we'll have to definitely have you back soon it's always a pleasure thank you this is your host and mortgage expert Tina Mitchell signing off for the day but I'll be here same place same time next weekend right here in 1150 AM KKNW enjoy the rest of your week everyone the preceding program is paid for by absolute mortgage division of finance of America mortgage LLC equal housing lender NMLS 1071 AZBK 0910184. Tina Mitchell, MLO 145420, is a licensed loan originator with Absolute Mortgage. Visit absoluteloans.com or call 888-90-HOMES for cost information.